Vi ska få lyssna till Dave Olsen. Och han behöver ingen närmare presentation. Vi fick träffa honom igår och lyssna till honom igår när han pratade över ämnet tjäna. Och vi kommer ihåg Axel, eller hur? Ja. Ja. Så Dave Olsen, warmly welcome up. It's you. Good morning. Here, and uh, I have had such a good time already here in your midst. And even though I do not speak Swedish, I hear English things. But are you there? Well, now I'm back. You also hear other things having to do with the group spirit and personality and that sort of thing. And uh, So it has been a great joy. So, I guess I'm supposed to get on with what I'm supposed to talk about, and uh, hopefully uh, this mic will work much better. Um, I want to tell you a couple of things first that are very important for you to understand. First of all, I do not have the gift of an evangelist. So here I am speaking on evangelism in a secular culture, and I don't have the gift. Now, most people who study these things would say that about 10% of Christians have the gift of an evangelist. So I want to see, anybody here think you have the gift of an evangelist? Feel free. I know in Sweden you're not supposed to put yourself ahead of the crowd, but it's okay. That's good. Now, the rest of us are the famous 90%. And what my experience as a pastor has been is if I don't have the gift of an evangelist, part of my call as a pastor, though, is to do the work of an evangelist. Now, I work with a person whose name is John Teeter. He is the evangelism team leader for the covenant, and he has the gift. And I can tell you, evangelism for him is not as hard work as it is for me. It's much more difficult when you don't have the gift. But I do think it's a really important thing for all pastors to say to God, I might not have the gift, but I want to do the work of an evangelist. So I come to you not as the one with the gift, but one that has to try to do the work. And then the second thing I'm very aware of is I am coming to a different culture than my own. Now, I've been over to Sweden four times now, and the frequency keeps increasing. I think I was here about eight years ago. About two years ago, there were a group of seven superintendents from the Covenant Church came over and spent a week, week and a half with a number of us on the East Coast of the United States. And I was here about two years ago. I was here last summer for a little bit and here now. So 
I'm starting to feel like this is my second home a little bit. Um, but I also understand, I do not understand your culture like you understand your culture. And you need to know that the United States has a very varied culture based on different parts of the country. So for example, there are some parts of the country where evangelism is not that difficult. For example, in the south of the country, it's kind of called the Bible Belt. I've heard you have kind of a Bible Belt here in Sweden as well. And that's not as difficult there. There are other parts of the country, and this would be the northern part of the east coast, the northern part of the west coast. So this would be New York City, this would be Boston, this would be Seattle, San Francisco. The uh, university cities are very challenging areas. In a sense, those kind of places in America are much closer to what it is in Europe than it is in other parts of the United States. So I realize that you're gonna have to take what I say and interpret it in your own culture and how it works for you. But I think the things I'm gonna talk about hopefully are rather simple and rather transferable. And I wanna start by introducing myself and introducing the context that I have ministered in theologically. And part of what I wanna be able to do is to let you know how much I owe to you for who I am as a person and how much the covenant owes to you for who we are as a group of churches. So there's a little saying, to move forward, you must first look backwards. So to know who I am, I can't just keep my eyes ahead, but I have to look back and I have to understand where I came from. And so, I'm going to give you my two-minute version of how this Swedish movement got started. And you may disagree, but don't say aloud while I'm talking about this. And it's a simplified version, but it's my way of explaining it to people. So the Reformation made the gospel alive once again in the lives of ordinary Christians. And that's really important. It wasn't just the leaders, it was in the lives of ordinary Christians, magnified by the invention of the printing press, which expanded the use of the Luther Bible and its successors. So part of what happened in the Reformation is it happened at the same time as the printing press, and so the availability of scripture became much more common and it was very important. What happened after the Reformation was something called scholasticism. So who followed Luther? It was Melanchthon and others besides him. But what scholasticism did is to organize and structure everything about Christianity. And there is a life in Christianity when you organize and structure it too much, it actually takes the life out of the being. And so there was a sense it accidentally took some of the life out of the church. And the response to that, especially in Northern Europe, was a thing that in English call, is called pietism. And pietism in the United States has gotten a bad name because people think pietism is to depart from the world and commune with God and ignore what's happening in the world. But that was never what pietism was. So here is my definition. Pietism was never an escape from this world, but rather the personal response to the extravagant love of a personal God. So instead of a far away and distant God, it was a personal God. And it was not just in general, but it came very specifically to you as a person. Pietism wanted to reveal the Jesus that first century peasants experienced. Because wasn't that who he came to? Not the scribes and Pharisees, really. He really came to the ordinary people. Not rules for a religion, but a Savior and Lord who loved you and whom you wanted to follow. Does that do anything for your heart? Now, to put it in a little bigger context, I think at the very same time in Europe, things were happening in art, music, and 
that are very similar to what was happening in pietism in religion. The same reaction occurred in Europe in art and music. There was a reaction to woodenness and overstructure, which was replaced by a desire to express beauty, love, and emotional response. And this produced the great Impressionist painters, for example, like Monet, and the great composers of the 19th century. And in religion, this romantic movement was called pietism. Now, is there anyone in the house here who likes romance? Okay, occasionally it's a little more feminine than male, but you'll have to sort that out for yourselves. But in a way, I think all of us love love. And so just as in music and art, those movements were trying to inject the human soul and emotion and love into things, in religion, pietism injects the love of God and the relationship of God. So I want to tell you how this affected me. And I want to tell you first about my grandfather, and then I want to tell you about a great-grandfather on the other side of the family. So in 1906, my father's father, my grandfather, who was, left, who was 16 years old, left Sweden and sailed by himself to the United States. He landed in New York City. He worked in the docks for a while. But of course, because he grew up on a farm, he eventually ended up moving into the middle of the United States and was able to become a farmer. And that's what he did the rest of his life. He was from Southeast Sweden and he immigrated because of economic reasons. Virtually everybody who came to America from Scandinavia emigrated because of economic reasons. Poor land, too many children. And uh, so I have a picture when my grandfather is 90 years old with my father and I. Now, you have to understand that, and maybe you can think of yourself in this. When I think of myself and ask, which relative is closest to me on the inside? It's my grandfather, Jan, okay? So, there it is. There's myself with my formerly thick glasses. There's my father with his thick glasses and my grandfather with his very thick glasses. And both of those had cataract operations and I fortunately lived a lot later than them and had my first cataract operation that took 10 minutes in November. And uh, so that's why you see the glasses there. Uh, but he was a tremendous man of God. He was just a farmer, but read his Bible every morning, prayed, loved Jesus, was a very hardworking, herky-jerky, make-it-happen kind of farmer. And he's very similar to me. And so on that side of the family, and, and my grandmother, Lydia, also was a very spiritual and godly person. In the other side of the family, and here's where it becomes more complex for some of you, and you may have a hard time loving me because of this, and you'll understand this in a second. In 1856, my mother's grandfather, or my great-grandfather, uh, who was 18 years old, left Norway and sailed with his family to the United States. Now the good news is that it was in 1856, so there really wasn't a Norway, was there? No, that was Sweden. And so he was really Swedish, but eventually got confused and called himself Norwegian. So, on these two sides of my family, my mother and my father, so I am a lot like my father's father. I'm more like my mother than my father, and that was the Norwegian side. But it felt like the spirituality came more from my father's side than from my mother's side. And this summer, we had an invitation to go and speak at the, in Norway, to the uh, pastors of the Norwegian Covenant Church. And so in preparation for this, I had to get out the family history book and read it and that sort of thing. And I found something really interesting here. So here's my, about my grandfather. He was from Sun, Norway, and immigrated because of economic reasons. Same story. Here he is, I'm going to show you in a minute, in 1909, age 71, with my grandmother, 
who you're going to see in the middle there, and with her stepsister, sister, and brother. So there's the family picture from the other side of the mountains. And there was my great-grandfather, Oli Lee. And in the middle there is a young grandmother, a very godly person. Her name was Bertha. And um, it's fun to see her so young, because I never knew her that young. So I want to tell you about my grandfather, because this is the one in the family tree I could find out most for. And I have a picture of him in a big oval frame uh, that I occasionally hang on the wall in front of where I'm going to be sitting so I can kind of stare into the eyes of my grand Norwegian grand great-grandfather. My great-grandfather was a farmer, a school teacher, and a lay preacher. And this is where I got sort of awakened to the spiritual side that was on my mother's side. He composed hymns and played the Salmodican. Do you know what that is? Okay, good. Because I did not know what it is. So when I was in the United States, before I went to Norway, I looked it up on Wikipedia. And I saw a picture of it and that sort of thing. Well, before we got to Norway, we stopped at Gothenburg because I was invited to speak at um, a church there, a covenant church there, B. Frost and Kirken. And uh, they had us stay with a couple in Mundal. And this couple was Marita and Nils. And Marita, for many years, has, had been the mayor of the city. And Nils, like, worked in chemistry and taught chemistry and that sort of thing. So we come in, sit down, have a cup of coffee with them right away. And he wants to show me some artifacts in his house. So he goes over into the side room and he brings out this rectangular box with a couple of strings on it. And that's what it was. And it was like, this is amazing because I've never heard of this. This is what my grandfather plays. And without me saying anything, our host understands somehow that he's supposed to bring this to me to get a connection back to my great-grandfather. Um, at family devotions, he would pray for each member of his family, asking that they would remain faithful to Christ. He was a kind, generous, and cheerful man. He died on March 27, 1913, so soon to be 100 years ago. Now, you can tell from this, this is just my great-grandfather that was born in 1838. We have very long generations in my family. His last words before he died at age 74 were that, was this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And when I read that, I had some spiritual things going on inside of me. So let me translate to this context and give you a little connection to the connection back in America. Beginning in 1850, hard economic times forced young Scandinavians to immigrate to the United States. Three pietistic groups developed there that were different from the state church Lutherans. And these groups were called the Evangelical Free Church, the Baptist General Conference, which before used to be called Swedish Baptists, and the Evangelical Covenant Church. So, by the way, I have to throw this in here real quick. Ephraim did not say this last night. But I am connected to two of the three groups here I'm in, the, in the new joint future. I'm connected to the Baptists and to the Covenant. And so in the early days of my life, I was a part of the Swedish Baptist movement. And somehow those Covenant people flipped me over to their side in 1993. So I have both of those. But I don't have the Methodist gene. Ephraim, though, do you know this? He is triply blessed. He grew up in a Baptist church, got a lot of ministry experience in a Methodist church, and God flipped him into the covenant as well, which is why you were resonating so much with him last night. You didn't realize this. He's got the whole joint future covered in his hands. Okay. Now today, now I want you to think about this. Is Sweden a big country? No, it was maybe four million people when this immigration was happening. It's what, nine million people now? Something like that. 
So I want to ask you this question. Who are the three fastest growing denominations in the United States right now? The Evangelical Free Church, the Baptist General Conference, and the Evangelical Covenant Church. Now, why do you think that is? Do you think it might have been something we got from you? Do you think so? <laughs> now, I understand Swedish culture. You're not allowed to admit this in public. <laughs> A small group of Christians from Scandinavia who had been revived by the life of Jesus sent some of their young adults. Now, you notice I highlighted young adults? If anything is going to happen in a movement of God, it has to have young adults in the forefront. And I want to tell you that because that's been my experience. I think it's God's work all over the world. They came to America and they started new churches and today close to one million people attend these churches. Isn't that kind of amazing? That from this small country and this smaller than the state church certainly movement of God, there's a million people attending these churches. These churches are growing because their people love Jesus. Jesus has transformed their lives, and they want others to experience the life-changing work of God. And this is my transition into evangelism, because part of what it means to love Jesus is to want other people to experience the love of God in a personal way in their life and heart and be transformed by Jesus. Now, if Ephraim was here, he would say amen, and you would say amen. Thank you. Okay, so, oh, went the wrong way. Amen. Thank you, Ephraim. <laughs> so I'm going to use the word conversion here, if that's okay. And I think we understand conversion happens in different ways to people. Sometimes it happens over a long period of time. Sometimes it happens almost like instantaneously. But conversion means I am no longer in the kingdom of darkness, but God has brought me into the kingdom of light. I have a regenerated or a new heart, and I have the Holy Spirit living in me, and I'm a follower of Jesus. That's a converted person. So conversion is when God takes a person and makes them a new creation by placing the life of Jesus in them, creating new life in Christ. And so the covenant is a conversionist movement. We believe that God wants to bring about conversion in the life of people. Now, I want to give you just a little bit of understanding here about where that um, comes from and, and why the covenant in America is such a big deal uh, that we are striving to work hand in hand with God to help other people become Christians. And so I am quoting here directly from the official covenant documents that have been around decades and decades and decades and stem all the way back to the late 1800s. <clears throat> when the covenant church affirms that it is evangelical, it proclaims that the new birth in Jesus Christ is essential. We teach that, quote, by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God conquered sin, death, and the devil, offering forgiveness for sins and assuring eternal life for those who follow Christ. New birth is more than the experience of forgiveness and acceptance. It is regeneration or God rebirthing something in us and the gift of eternal life. This life has the qualities of love and righteousness as well as joy and peace. And then it goes on to say, Jesus said to Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. To enter the kingdom is not only to have a right relationship with God, but to be enlisted in Christ's service. God's purposes entail the transformation of purposes or of persons, as well as the transformation of God's world into a place of truth, justice, and peace. Is that it? That's it. So, 
Why do I tell you this story? Spiritually, the American Covenant Church owes everything in our life together to the heritage we receive from you. Now, did you notice I put that word everything there? So, Don Ing Ingebrigtsen, do you think that is true? Yes. Thank you very much. <laughs> I would have been in deep trouble. <laughs> you did very good. Now, obviously, we've learned a lot of things, but it was from that heritage that the foundation and the roots and how we live our life, that is so important to us. And who did we learn that from? Thank you. I want you to understand this. You know, we're second generation. You were the first generation that got all this. And this is a very personal thing for me. Spiritually, I owe everything in my life to the heritage I receive from godly parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents who experienced a vital life of God in Sweden and Norway. It's just the way it is. I, I owe everything to that heritage. And then I want to tell you about Shelly and my oldest daughter, Erica. She uh, recently completed her PhD in theology. And in her thesis, in the very beginning, she wrote a very short little dedication. And she dedicated her thesis to her family and to her teachers. And then she added this. I also want to express appreciation for the religious heritage of my family rooted in an evangelical expression of Swedish pietism from which I learned that what is desired of God's people is that they seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly. Now, did I tell her to write that on the very first page of her thesis? <laughs> well, I really did not. <clears throat> and just after she got her, had her official final grilling and got her degree, she emailed this to us and we had no idea she was gonna say this. But that tells us that what is in you is deeply where? In her. It has passed down these generations and so it's not just myself or my wife, but it is also our children that experience the life of Christ in large part because of the Swedish revivals that went on. So you have to understand that. And that's why for me to talk about evangelism in a secular culture to you, uh, it's an enjoyable kind of thing. And so I'm gonna move forward into that, but I wanted you to understand that it, all of this is rooted in the gospel and all of this is rooted in the experience that we have had together. We're just on different sides of the ocean. So. What I want you to do is, I, as we go through this, is I have four questions from four different scriptures that I want us to ponder together. And I'm gonna talk about each of those. And we're gonna talk about some ideas, but we're gonna get very practical about how evangelism works in a local church. So hopefully these will not just be ideas, but these will be how-to things that you can put into practice. And we've also brought some resource type of things to help you as well in uh, some of the things that we have tried to work on. So we're gonna start with a little dialogue bet between you and I'd like you in just a moment to find one other person. Uh, there probably have to be a couple triads or three people that do this. But I read a study that said recently, just like Three months ago, 75% of the members of the Swedish Lutheran Church do not believe there is a God. And if you ever, did you ever see this study? Okay, well, so here's what I want you, I want you to ask this question, do you think that is accurate? So just grab another person to sit next to you, just talk about this, you know?
Okay. I can tell if I do not interrupt you, you could go on for 10 to 20 minutes talking about this. But I have to tell you, I was a pretty surprised by that study that people who are members of church don't believe in God. But it reminds all of us, does it not, that Sweden is a secular culture. It is no longer a culture of Christendom. That world has passed away and is no longer. It is a secular culture. And Christians face an intellectual challenge in this area, and I want to talk about it briefly. The secular mindset in this secular culture only believes that the material or physical is real. Over the last 200 years of modernism, this has been the effect of modernism, that if you cannot physically touch it, if it is not physical in this world, it isn't anything that's real. And so anything that is invisible is unreal. Now, you maybe think I'm overstating it, but I think that's how a culture understands things in a secular culture. But Christians believe in the physical. I hope so. We'd be in deep trouble if we didn't. But we also believe in truth, goodness, beauty, love, and God, those big five. Now, the big three are the things philosophers talk about, truth, goodness, and beauty. The fourth one is the one the Bible talks about. And the fifth one is obviously why we're gathered here, because of our belief of a God in this world. And it's really interesting if you think about it, because what are the most meaningful things in the world, the physical things or the invisible things? It's not even close, is it? So, how many of you like beauty? Okay, I hope all of you <laughs> raise your hand. Now, we understand beauty is mediated through physical things, but beauty is something more than physical things. So for most people, when you see a beautiful range of mountains covered by snow and a mountain lake in front of it, what do you have inside of yourself? A beauty reaction, right? You can't help but having an inside response to this beauty. But how is that beauty reaction, reaction connected to the physicality of the mountains? Why would it be that mountains create that beauty feeling in you? We don't really know. It's not the physical, is it? It's something beyond the physical that is the thing that is much more meaningful than the physical itself. And I would suggest to you in a secular culture they have accidentally tried to drain culture from the things that really give meaning to people. So I have a quote here from John G. West. The European intellectual classes became convinced that the only reality was material, and thus the only explanations were reductive. I'm going to explain what that word means in the next two here. If you want to explain a flower, you describe its cell structure, not its beauty. If you want to explain human beings, you look not to their greatest achievements, but to the raw materials they were composed of. One result of the denial of reason is that people will become skept so skeptical that they believe in nothing. And I think that's some of what happens in a secular culture, whether it's in the United States or in Sweden. Now, I have to tell you about another thing I was amazed at. Uh, somewhere nine, 12 months ago, there was a debate over the existence of God between Richard Dawkins, anybody have heard of Richard Dawkins, one of the most famous atheist scientists in the world, and Rowan Williams, who is the Archbishop of Canterbury, so the head of the Church of England. And in this discussion, as they're talking back and forth, Richard Dawkins made a huge mistake. Do you know what he said? He said, I believe there is maybe a one in 70 chance that there's a God. Now, you're, if you are an atheist, do you ever want to open that door a crack? 
No, 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 no. And so all of a sudden, all of the assumptions of atheism go away because of that crack in the door. That, okay, well, maybe there is no God, but what if there is a God? Is life any different if when you open the crack in the door, you discover there really is a true God in the world? And who is that God like? So this is an interesting conversation. If Richard Dawkins is willing to open the crack in the door, we ought to feel confident that we in Sweden can open that crack a little bit and ask that question to a pretty secular culture. You know, even the world's foremost atheist thinks there might be a God. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> so. I'm gonna want you to get in your groups in just a minute, and here's what I want you to do. As I've talked to different folks, even this week in Sweden, I've tried to kind of sift and sort and ask questions about what we're talking about. And I'm gonna define the world as three different groups of people. And so modernism is really the things that started in the late 1700s and made their way all to today, but it's, what's considered the modern world. And people who are moderns typically say, there is no God, I am sure. But then there's another group because every generation has to react to the previous generation and say, you're not quite right, we got it figured out better than you. And these are called the postmoderns. So the postmodern says, it really does not matter, I'll find my own meaning in life. That would be my sense of what postmoderns think. I have to do it on my own. I have to find meaning that exists for me in life. But I think the 20s and 30-somethings in Sweden maybe are a part of a third group, which is the post-postmodern. Now, we have never heard of this word ever because I just made it up <laughs> yesterday. So. But you hear what I'm saying. It's a reaction to the first two. And I think they say something different. I am not an atheist, but Christianity does not attract me. I'm not sure what there is. I don't want to go with the atheist stuff of my parents and grandparents, but I'm not very attracted to Christianity. Do you know any people like that? So, Get together in your little group again and have a little conversation on this. Where do you find people landing if these three categories can help you place some people in them? Okay, go. All right, time's up.
as a group, you make a really good roar. <laughs> roar. Okay, so. I discovered I made a mistake on my slides here and I accidentally erased the next slide. So, I'm gonna talk about two verses in Mark 8, 28 and 29, but 8, 28 is somewhere in cyberspace. But I'm gonna tell you what it says. It, Jesus starts by asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? So rather than, he's gonna to get to the second question we're gonna look at in a minute. But, so get that in your mind. What we're gonna look at first is who do people say that I am? And that's what we've been talking about so far. We've been talking about in our culture, in Swedish culture, if Jesus asked the question to you, who do people say that I am? What would they say in Sweden? Now here's what I want you to think about. How many Swedes do you think have an accurate picture of Jesus that was presented in the Gospels? What percentage would you say? Anybody want to? 10%? 15? Five? Okay, those are the three numbers you should decide from. We won't decide now, but I think one of those three ranges is right. It's either five, 10, or 15. But I would be very surprised if it was more than 15% had an accurate picture of who Jesus was and what he came to do, what he said, how he treated people, all those sort of things. Now, what challenge does that give you? Our challenge number one is people imagine Christianity is something that it is not at all because they have not started at the founder of Christianity, which is Jesus. And if you don't have an accurate picture of what Jesus said and did, how can you ever have any idea of what it would mean to be a Christian? So how do people figure out what it means to be a Christian in Sweden? I'll tell you what I think. They look at churches, they look at Christians, and they both see them truly, but they also stereotype those and create a caricature of something that is probably not as good as it really is. Do you think that's possible? And so, not only do they know very, very little about Jesus, they end up jumping to assumptions very often by taking some of the things that aren't very good, some of the bad stories, and assume they're the normal stories instead of really exploring for themselves. So, when you ask that question, that's an important one to ask, and that's what we've been talking about for 10 minutes. Who do people say that I am? So here's the second one. But then he asks his disciples, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? Now, this is called drilling in on the disciples. You know that word, drill in? In other words, was it easy for them to talk about the other people, what the Pharisees thought of Jesus, what the tax collectors, what the Romans, was that easy to talk about? Yeah, that's kind of like gossip magnified, right? That's an easy question to talk about. The hard question to talk about Uh oh, I think this is. There we go. Let me try this here and see if that sometimes. There we go. Okay, it's a miracle. Thank you, Lord. I was instructed never to touch this little wire again. Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, let me say something that's really important here. The foundation of everything I think Ephraim and I and Don will talk about, I think, here at this conference 
is the message and mission of Jesus, because that is the core of our faith. Um, we have a number of resources for you if you're interested in getting them. I wrote a book a while back that the last third of it was uh, five chapters on the message and mission of Jesus, and I tried to change a few words so you'd actually think I was talking only about the uh, Swedish church rather than the American church. And, uh, but I think most of it applies to you. There's some examples from some new churches in the covenant we started that they're in America, and I'll have to work with somebody to get some good Swedish stories in there. But I think it would really give you a, a valuable chance to wrestle with and ponder what really was the message and mission of Jesus. Evangelism will not occur unless Christians are experiencing the powerful gospel in their life. Now, I got to just stop here and make sure we understand this. If we are not experiencing the life transformation because of the powerful work of God in our life, why would anyone want to become a Christian? Is that right? I don't think we understand that. I, they are watching us to see if we are living a life worth living that might give them some inkling that they may be interested in what this is within us. You know, we are the messengers for Jesus. We are, sometimes they say, we are little Jesus, in a sense. We are people that carry around in us through the Spirit and through our relationship with Christ the ability to communicate to people who Jesus is. And so this is why when Jesus says, but who do you think I am to the disciples? That's a, that's a challenging question. This was the revelatory moment for Peter, if you remember, because he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So the next thing I want to tell you about that's related to us in terms of who do we think he is, is in the New Testament there is a strong correlation between belief in the resurrection of Jesus and the effectiveness of evangelism. Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of this before, but later on, before I'm done, we'll be looking at Acts chapter 17, and we're going to see something going on there that you maybe never even noticed. But in most cases in scripture, there's a strong correlation between the resurrection of Jesus and people becoming Christians. And it really is rather simple. And so I'm gonna read uh, verses two to four of the very first chapter of Romans. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures regarding his son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a summary of the gospel. Who was appointed Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ his Lord, as, as Lord. The same thing happens in conversion as happened in the resurrection. A dead person comes alive. Do you understand that? <clears throat> now, I would suggest to you, if God was not able to raise Jesus from the dead, he will never be able to give new life to people. Does that make sense? If, if God can't do one, he can't do the other. <clears throat> now. The resurrection is a complex thing, if you are all biblical scholars, which I assume every one of you is. And so I brought along another little article that I think you might enjoy, it's in English, but it is, Can a Scientist Believe in the Resurrection? And it is written by my personal patron saint. His name is N.T. Wright, and he used to be the Bishop of Durham in England, and he is now kind of in semi-retirement and is a professor at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. And um, this is, for my understanding, if you want one scholarly but accessible piece to read that will be a powerful um, encourager for you that the resurrection really happened, this is the best thing I've ever read that can give you that clarity on what happened there. So. There's copies of this up front too. 
So did you all get this? Nobody's becoming, going to become a Christian unless we live a life that causes them to say, I want that. The next one is this question just a few verses later in Mark 8. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Now, as human beings, we have the physicality part of our life. But we do know that when we die, the physical part will be left. And if you're a secular atheist, that's called annihilation. You're gone, zap, squelch, nothing left. That's all there is. Christians believe there's something else that goes on there. Christians believe there's another part of people that are, is invisible that God created to live forever, and that is called our soul. And Jesus is really pushing in here, and he's pushing in on this issue of what if you have everything else in the world, but your soul isn't right? And that really is the question of evangelism, isn't it? What if you make, a, well, in this case would be, let's say, 20 million kroners, but you haven't taken care of your soul. When you die, not much to look forward to. So I want to be real practical for the next 10, 12 minutes here. <clears throat> and I want to talk about the question, how? And I'm going to just kind of lay out in the covenant in the United States how we have tried to structure this in ways that can help pastors, help people be a part of God's work in evangelism. And we really base it on Luke chapter 10, verses 1 to 24. That's one of the most powerful passages in the Gospels. And when you get back to your room, if you remember, sit down and read those 24 verses. I'm going to quote just a couple of them here. But it talks about the 72, and here's what it says in verse 1. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, how many disciples did he pick? Twelve. Were the disciples the 72? No. Who are the 72? They're just average people. These are the people in your church are the 72. Does this make sense? These aren't the disciples he's training. These aren't the professional ministers. Do we know any of their names? Do, do we know what they did? But Jesus sent them into the world to go into the towns and villages to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal people. Okay? Now think about it for a minute. What would happen if the people in your church actually thought they were the 72? Would that make any difference? We have a church in Chicago, a friend of mine, a covenant church, a friend of mine is the pastor. And he was leading up to something I'll explain in a minute. But he was giving a sermon on the 72. And at the end, he decided to ask people to come forward if they wanted to be a part of the 72. Now this is a church that is a little more traditional and liturgical and never ask people to come forward, just so you know. They always sit in their pews properly and at the end of the service they quietly leave. But he asked them, if you want to be part of the 72, please come forward. And what happened is some people started coming forward. What eventually do you think happened? How many people came forward? Every person in the congregation got out of their seat and walked forward and said, I want to be part of the 72. If you're a pastor, what are you feeling at that moment? Okay, let's make a verbal affirmation. Woo! Right? This is unbelievable. Everybody in my church wants to be part of the mission of God in the world. Okay? So that's part of why we do it. But then it goes into, and these are four words I'm going to use. They're simple, one-syllable words that are what we focus on to help lay people be the 72 in the world. And the first one is prayer. The very next 
verses, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Now, on all of your sheets, you got this. Okay, take this out for a minute. But for about 20 years, the covenant in America has done this, and we pick a Sunday in typically March where this happens. If you open it up to the inside on the left side, you see prayer quadrant, okay? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a pen out, maybe most of you have pens out, and it says family, work associates, friends, and neighbors, okay? And I want you to take two minutes and write down on this left side anybody who you know that fits in one of those four categories who is not a Christian and you would love for them to experience new life in Christ. Can you do that? So take your pen. Hopefully you'll have one or two names in each of the four boxes. So what would happen if every member of your church had a list of people that they were praying for regularly that these people would experience new life in Christ? Would that be a good thing? That would be a really good thing. So this is something we do. There's on this side here, there's a little tear off. This part here, they tear off and put it in an offering basket at that service. And the tear off next to it is a list they can put in their Bible or on their refrigerator or something like that. And we also have an online thing that will send an, that they can insert their information on it and it will send them once a week an email reminding them of who they're praying for and a scripture verse and an inspiring story of God at work. So we're trying to encourage prayer. Why is this? Evangelism is, first of all, a spiritual battle in the heavenlies. Do you understand that? This is God against the forces of evil. And the forces of evil do not want anyone to come to repentance and experience the new life of Christ. And God so much wants none to perish, but all to experience the life of Christ. And so this is a big deal. And this is why we have to start with prayer. And so to even think about evangelism without finding out how can we get people in our church praying for those they love who do not know Christ, that has to be the beginning point. (coughs) Now I'm going to run out of time. I have 10 minutes left, so I'm going to go a little faster here. The second word, oh, we already did that. The second word is friendship. So first is prayer, the second is friendship. And Luke 10, 5 to 7 describes what this is. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Boy, it's like they entered a house in Sweden. Isn't this what you'd say in Sweden? It's very Swedish. You know, peace is like huge, right? Okay, I know it is. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there eating and drinking whatever they give you 
for the worker deserves his wages, do not move from house to house. In other words, become friends with these people. And I'd like you to think that most of the people who become Christians in your church should become Christians out of friendship relationships. It's not an impersonal thing. It's not watching somebody on the television. That's not the best way for it to happen. The best way for it to happen is a person to see the life of Jesus lived out in a friend of theirs. And so if you can get people to pray for those who they love who are not Christians, then the next one is to encourage them to build friendships. And it's really interesting because in those four quadrants, there's a lot of people who we would put on that list, but we need to work harder at building the relationship, the friendship. So I'll give you an example. Shelly has a sister, and she lives in Alaska. So she lives two and a half thousand miles, well, 25,000 kilometers from where we live. It's a long, long, long way up there. And Sue is not a Christian, and we pray for her. When I was up there a few times ago, I had a really interesting conversation with her about spiritual things. But you know what? The first thing she needs to know is that we really love her and care for her in a genuine way. Nothing else will matter. None of the words we say about God make any difference if they don't feel the relationship, if they don't feel the love. So that's the second one. So who are your long-term relationships that you can develop? Who are your new relationships that you can develop? I have found that God often will place a new person in my life because God wants me to have some connection with them for something God wants to do. And so I'm trying to be on the lookout and ask God, who are people that I may be connecting with? Um, like we rent a condo. So the owner of the condo, his name is Lenny. Lenny's Italian. And um, <laughs> so I pray for Lenny. And I've taken him out to lunch. I'm trying to build a relationship. Friendship, the, the power tool of friendship is hospitality. Hospitality is what was said there, give people food and drink, have them in your house. That's the power tool of friendship, is hospitality. Um, a noted theologian said this. When was asked, give me a simple description of the four gospels. He said this, Jesus ate good food with bad people. And I thought, that's pretty good. Jesus ate good food with bad people. That's hospitality. Not, not that we're saying they're bad people, but you know what he's saying there. Okay. So the first one is prayer. The second is? And the third one is experiences. Now, we all, I think, can figure out the first and second. To me, the third and fourth are the ones that often don't happen. And so I'm just going to be very clear and direct on this. A person will never become a Christian unless they have an experience with God. Pretty simple, isn't it? So how does a person have an experience with God? Where does a person ex have an experience with God? So what we've tried to think about is where are these places where God shows up? And Here are the six ones we think are the most important experiences that you can have a person be involved in that will allow them to have a sense that God is real. Because that's what they want to know. That's what they want to know. Is God real and does he really love me? That's what they want to know. So, answered prayer. So if you're talking to a person who's not a Christian and you can ask them, is there anything you'd like me to pray for you about? Maybe this doesn't work in Sweden, but in America almost everybody says, oh yes. And so they'll tell you that. And you will be praying that God will answer the prayer so they will know what? That God is real. Then answered questions. People who are not Christians. They have all sorts of questions about God in the Bible. And they want to have answers. Uh, there is no better place for a person to become a Christian than a Bible study. 
Uh, the Alpha course is a great example of this. They combine eating food with a Bible study and it is an easy place for people to become a Christian because they experience God. Your church worship services, when the Holy Spirit is working through your worship services and the preached word, people are convicted by God. Christian community, they are watching your church to see if you are the kind of people that embody something that they don't have. And the sixth one is service projects. A lot of that is compassion, mercy, and justice to the last, the lost, and the least. And invite them to come on the ways in which your church serves. Here's the final one is story. There's a special power in the story of Jesus. Now, I gotta go pretty fast here, but when Paul is in Athens at the uh, Areopagus or Mars Hill, they ask him a question, or they say to themselves this question, what is this babbler trying to say? Okay, now, who is the babbler? We are all the babblers, okay, right? And people who are not Christians, they're saying, I have, what babbler means is, I have no idea what he's talking about, okay? But we have an advantageous person who works on our behalf, and that's called the Holy Spirit, who can turn babbles into something that makes sense. So I want you to think about this, and we don't have the time to read the scripture, but this is what Paul did when he gave his sermon at the Acropolis in Athens. He talked about Israel. Now, you want to pretend you're the Athenians, okay? To your left is Israel, a worthless nation. You don't even give a rip about them, right? To your right is those nasty Romans who have overpowered you even though you're the most brilliant and culturally important people in the world. Is that Greek? That was it. So, he talks about Israel. And what would have the Athenians said? Oh, sure, that small vassal state between Egypt and Babylon. Right? Not important to them. Then he mentions this person Jesus and says Jesus is the Messiah who would have what would have they said we've never heard the word Messiah what is he talking about got this babbler they're not understanding he says Jesus was crucified they would say yes those nasty Romans know how to end a revolution don't they then he says this Jesus is the judge of the world. And they would say, how dare this Jew Jesus judge the Greeks, the cultural elites of the whole world. And then he talks about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. And they would have said, that doesn't happen here in Athens. Never seen it, right? So they had no cultural apparatus to help them understand the story of God. But here's what happens. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. So when you're doing evangelism, you're going to experience two things. One is rejection. But there's also going to be people that go, oh, I want to find out more about this. And um, then it says, some of the people became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, which would have been like a senator. And then a woman named Damaris, who obviously was an influential woman as well in Athens, and a number of others. But here's the key thing. There is supernatural power in the story of Jesus. Do you realize this? When people hear the story of Jesus, it will connect in a deeper way with people in a way they don't understand why that is. And the story of his life and how he loved people and how he cast out demons and how he healed people, how he cared for women, how he cared for men, how he was crucified and how he rose from the dead Somehow that story causes people's heart to leap, and they don't know why that is, but it's the power of the gospel. 
And that's why we have to figure out how to tell the story of Jesus well. Um, we have another one up here that we have about 50 copies of, which is called Jesus and the Great Story of God. And this was actually written for Christians. In about six months, we hope to have one of these written for non-Christians. But this is to tell the story of Jesus to Christians and to kind of fire them up about the faith that they have and, and why they really love Jesus. So that's a really important thing. I want to close here, and I'm one minute over already, and I apologize, but Kurt, do I have three minutes still? Two minutes, okay. I want to tell you about Jacob. Jacob lives in Gothenburg. He's my wife's third cousin. And um, he came to our house in the United States twice when he was in his early 20s. He comes to this church, Bifrost and Kirken, that we were at two years ago. Frederick Wall was there. I'm speaking. We're going to have dinner together. He comes in the back right door. He looks at this bald-headed, shaved-headed guy. He, that guy, Frederick, looks at him, and they realize we know each other, but they can't figure out who it is. Now, how likely is that? Because Frederick lives in the United States, although he's from Sweden. And what happens is they went to a folk school together near Yonshiping, is that right? And so when I got, I go over to the restaurant with him and I discover he's losing his faith. He wants to talk about all these hard verses of the Bible. And so Frederick tells me when he was in folk school, he was a Christian and was really fired up about the Lord. And I'm going, what's going on? So on Friday, just a couple of days ago, Shelley and I spent three hours with him in his place in downtown Gothenburg. And what he really ended up telling us is, I don't believe in God anymore. In fact, I want to go around to convince people that God is not real. So we had a most interesting conversation with our friend Jacob. And God was there, and it was interesting because I, in my family, argumentation was like a sport, so I like to argue. But Shelley was much wiser than I was and would kind of get away from the argument and get down to the real heart of the matter. So we maybe balanced each other well. But as we left, I remember I gave him a hug and I said, I love you, Jacob. And he looked at me and he said, now we can keep this conversation going, can't we? Can we keep this conversation going over the internet? And earlier on, Shelley had told him, you know, Jacob, I think God is at work, and we're here because God wants you as a member of his family. And it was an amazing time, and I thought, oh, thank you, Lord, you brought me here to Sweden to talk about this hard subject of evangelism in a secular culture, and then you make me have to actually do it before I come here. And so I want to encourage you to pray for Jacob. But there are millions of Jacobs in Sweden. And they do not, they just are confused. They haven't heard the story. They've heard the wrong story. They've got a picture that wasn't the right picture. But God dearly loves them. And my prayer for you is that in your church, as you can help lay people be the 72, God can do some amazing things in bringing people to faith in Christ. Amen.